Today I'm giving an overview of how to become a biblical activist. So how do you bring about social justice and do it God's way? This is an area that the church has pretty much abandoned in our age. Uh, they all, will often view on biblical forms of social justice and react as if all social justice is wrong, uh, or they'll claim that it's a distraction from the gospel. So <clears throat> this video is for people, for Christians, uh, who understand that we are supposed to work on cultural change, but you want to avoid unbiblical and humanistic solutions. So how can we go about doing that? Uh, I'm going to take this opportunity to introduce you to the abolitionist movement. Uh, we are biblical. We are working to become a biblical alternative to the pro-life movement. So uh, we have the history uh, of abolishing slavery in uh, the United States, specifically abolishing the slave trade in Great Britain. Uh, but really the principles, and, and this is what the abolitionists of slavery said, the same principles that applied to the evil in their age applied to the great evils of our age. So we focus on abortion. We believe in that to be the biggest evil of our age. Um, so we're going to look through the theology, practice, and strategy of abolitionists here in this video. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Nate Schmolze. I'm a writer, a political activist, and a YouTuber. Uh, I train people to think and act biblically in areas of social justice, politics, and theology at large. So I used to think that activists were kind of crazy, going out there holding signs, street preaching, whatever you end up doing. Um, now I'm one of them. <laughs> so obviously I've gone through a transformation in my theology and my understanding of this. So my goal is to walk you through uh, just some of that transformation in this video and maybe perhaps turn you into a crazy activist like one of these. Like yeah. that's pretty Rape is absolutely a terrible thing. But the, like, the thing is, is, I guess if you take it away from this particular issue and look at um, theft, for example, which obviously isn't as heinous as rape or murder, but if you look at if you look at theft, right, just because, like, if you know, one of those guys came over here and stole all of my stuff, does that then give me the right to then steal all of your stuff, to pass the wrong on to you? Because the, the question ultimately comes down to, are you dealing with a human being when they're in the womb? And if you are, then you're actually committing murder against that person, right? Well, you're, you're harming that person to solve the problem of rape. You know, Sally, Margaret Sanger invented abortion for black people. She wanted to kill black people. She was a racist white woman. And that's mostly who's coming in here, black and Latino people. It's a wicked thing. God said that there's no Greek, no Jew in Christ alone. But the fact is we know who they're targeting here. Ma'am, understand that if you murder your child today, you will be accountable before the true and the living God for a great evil. And there is hope for evil people, even the evils that have brought you here to kill your child today. I will tell you, I am guilty of great evil, things that God in His Word says is worthy of death. Just like murder, just like killing a child is worthy of death, I too have been guilty. But I have been washed clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. And you too, no matter what is in your past, no matter what has led you to come here today, you can be washed by the blood of Jesus Christ and you can make a right and righteous decision. So here's what you can expect from this video. We're going to talk very briefly about the history of abolition. That's not really the focus of this video, but I'm going to give you some resources you can go to to learn what happened during the abolition of slavery and how it connects to the evils of our age. Uh, then I'm going to look through the five tenets of abolitionism, give you a brief introduction to those. This is the, the theological system, the ideas that we believe are necessary in order to abolish great evils from society. So uh, briefly stated, abolition is biblical, it's gospel-centered, body-driven, it's done by the church, done by Christians, immediate and uncompromising, and providential. So we'll go into what all that means. Uh, we'll look at the two modes of abolition. What practical application looks like, and those are assistance and agitation. And then we'll talk about the seven stages of abolition, what we expect has to happen in the culture in order to actually end the evil of abortion and any other evils that are cropping up, like sodomy. So in this, we're going to talk more about what than why. Uh, I have a lot of other videos already, and as we before, I'm going to develop videos on each of these subjects. Uh, that go in depth and answer objections and whatnot. So this is mostly just an introductory video. Uh, my goal in doing it, I want to persuade you first and foremost to just learn more about what abolitionists believe. So 
this is going to be an index to lots of other resources and videos. Uh, I want to persuade you to learn more. I want to persuade you to integrate abolitionism into your everyday life. So biblical activism, I believe it should be a part of every Christian life, uh, like prayer, like other things. Then uh, I want you to spread these ideas, if you agree with them, spread these ideas to your circle of friends. So that's my goal, why I'm making this video. And I also want to communicate how abolition is a cross to bear, right? It's not something you do because you want to. I don't I don't work to abolish abortion because I want to, because I feel specially called, because it's something that I am even necessarily passionate about. Lots of people say I'm passionate about it. Uh, I do it because I believe it's my duty. And that's what I want to communicate to you give you resources that defend that idea. So uh, one video in particular I've already done defending that idea in depth. It's a full hour and 40 minutes, I think. It's called Abortion Ministry, Special Calling or Everyone's Duty. Uh, and I, I believe that's one of the most important ideas to defend as an abolitionist, the idea that it's everyone's duty. Because if you come to agree with that one idea, you'll take the time to learn everything else if you're somebody who wants to honor Christ and, and uh, be able to face him in eternity. So uh, starting out with the history, uh, I'm going to show you a clip from, uh, this is just a great series done by PBS. Uh, it's called American Experience. Uh, and then they did three episodes on the abolitionists. Very well done. They didn't shy away from the Christian foundations of it. I uh, just want to give you a flavor of it. And you can see a link in the description for where you can go to actually watch the whole thing. As the daughter of one of South Carolina's first families, Angelina Grimke lived in almost unimaginable luxury. In the 1820s, Charleston's aristocracy was one of the wealthiest societies on earth. But Angelina found it almost unbearable, an empire of sin. The story goes that each of them and the family had their own personal slave behind them when they ate dinner. And if the salt and pepper were next to the person sitting next to you, you didn't ask them to pass it. Your slave got it from his slave and gave it to you. There was nothing that you had to do that there wasn't a slave who took care of it for you. Did you hear last night? Hear what? Really? Angelina, what are you talking about? You know. Henry, he, he, he whipped John again. I told you before, dear. That's Henry's business. Angelina attacked slavery, not in the beginning because she cared about the slaves. It is Henry's business. You know she was saying? really you concerned about the fate of their white masters. I ask you to leave him alone. He's my brother. Yes, I know. She believed slavery was a sin and that God would punish people who had slaves. Mother, it is my duty to bear testimony Angelina, against... Angelina, mind your own business. It is my business, can't... and it's your business too. Let How can you stand in church you every let week? it be. I can't let it be. Have you no Christian feelings? Yes, Angelina, I have Christian feelings, and you are putting them to the test right now. My soul will be judged by the Lord and not by you or anyone else. It is my duty. It is not your duty, Angelina. I'm glad, I suppose, that you are so diligent about your faith. But leave my soul to me and Henry's to Henry. I speak the truth in love. Enough! Mother, 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 listen to me. Mother! Angelina's religious search was tortured, tortured, tortured. She was more or less on her own as she struggled with very deep 
and troubling issues about herself and her relationship to God. In the fall of 1829, Grimke resolved to leave Charleston and the pollutions of slavery for an uncertain future in the North. There's a kind of fearlessness about Angelina Grimke. Women did not strike out. White women did not strike out on their own in this way, and Southern white women certainly did not. This is disobedience to proper society, to the South, to the church. As I've mentioned, you can watch the full series uh, at a link in the description. But um, Angelina Grimke is just a good first case study. Um, she's a Philadelphia abolitionist when she moved up north, uh, right in my area. So she's somebody that I've spent a lot of time learning about. Wasn't perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but she was very courageous. And that's what what the abolitionists were, is they were laying pretty much their entire lives. Some of them were even killed for it uh, on the line for the rights of these slaves out of love for a neighbor. So um, another thing you could read if you wanted to, uh, you could read her appeal to the Christian women of the South. Um, and she's just one of many great abolitionists. Uh, she was there at the burning of Pennsylvania Hall. But the, the idea is that sometimes obedience to God does necessitate, as they were talking about in the video, does necessitate disobedience to the state and even disobedience to the church when these institutions are defying the word of God and the kingship of Christ. So abolitionists were not perfect and neither are abolitionists today, but we build our movement on the word of God. So you can learn more at that link. Uh, you can also learn more at um, a link that I'll include. Also, it's a video, a free video on YouTube, um, Abolitionism 101, Defining Abolitionism. It's a fantastic video by T. Russell Hunter. Uh, it shows a connection between historic and modern abolitionists. So what the first series, um, the PBS series, doesn't really give application to the evils of our age. Uh, so this was uh, a video that actually does that, and it links um, how, uh, how we draw our ideas from the abolitionists and ultimately from scripture. So if you want to learn more, that's another resource. Uh, you can just read source material from the American and British abolitionists. There's a lot out there. Uh, I'm constantly learning from them. The key point in this section on history is just that abortion abolitionists and um, slavery abolitionists are the same people. We build on the same foundation of the word of God. And our, our using that foundation leads us to certain ideas on how you deal with sin, uh, national sin. So getting into those ideas, we're going to take a look now at the five tenets of abolitionism. Uh, this is this is something I, I believe that abolitionists today have really put together. Uh, I'm not aware of any historical sources that tie all these ideas together into a system, a theological system. Uh, but these are ideas that the abolitionists of slavery had in their writings and whatnot. So uh, modern abolition came basically from uh, people in Oklahoma studying the abolitionists and systematizing these ideas. So to be clear, uh, we are not pro-life, right? That's, if you say, uh, if you call an abolitionist pro-life, it's an insult. <laughs> we, we understand what you mean. Uh, it means that you're against abortion, but we don't identify with the pro-life movement. So uh, in uh, historically, the abolitionists had a rival movement, a rival anti-slavery movement. It wasn't just pro-slavery versus anti-slavery. It was pro-slavery, versus abolitionist versus the colonization society. Basically two different strategies that were in place, two different ideologies really, about how to deal with the problem of slavery if you're against it. So we would agree with the pro-life movement that abortion is bad, uh, but we disagree with them foundationally on how you solve it. So uh, you can check out the video I did, Biblical Critique of Pro-Life Diversity. Uh, it's just one of many areas where the pro-life movement uh, really abandons the word of God. So 
that'll give you more information, but basically in each of these key ideas, um, the antithesis to what we believe is believed on the pro, the pro-life movement. So we'll get into some of that perhaps, uh, what we're seeing today is uh, we are seeing organizations, pro-life organizations, formerly pro-life organizations, begin to separate because the pro-life movement has been kind of an a umbrella of people who are genuinely Christian and genuinely want to end abortion um, and do so biblically. And then those who discard the word of God and who don't think that God should have anything to do with it, but they're, they're still against abortion. These groups working together. Um, so we're seeing a separation into two movements in our day as well it's between the abolitionists and the pro-lifers. So uh, if you want a list of good organizations, you can uh, check out my website. It's under additional resources. Uh, the key difference is uh, between pro-life and abolitionist is what we believe and that leads to a difference in what we do. So five tenets uh, mentioned earlier, uh, biblical, gospel-centered, body-driven, done by the church immediate compromising and providential so it's a huge topic we can't go into all the details or fully defend each of those ideas today uh, but uh, i'll walk through each one describe it and give you one bible verse uh, one or two bible verses about why we would come to these conclusions so first tenet abolition is biblical uh, i'll pull up matthew 7 it's basically talking about the foundations of a person's life. Jesus at the end of the Sermon on the Mount is talking to his disciples and talking about what their foundation should be um, that would support all these uh, laws that he's been uh, he's been giving them all these commands. It says everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. So, you know, the idea is if the Bible is God's revelation uh, and if the words of Christ are God's revelation, right? Uh, and if it's an account of God's work to abolish wickedness from the earth, which I don't think any Christian would object that it is, uh, then our participation in that work that, that God's doing to abolish evil should flow from his work, right? We should be grounding our work in what he's doing and building on his foundation. And so if he says that the words of Christ are what cause your foundation, uh, what cause what you're building to stand, uh, then you want to build on the words of Christ and Christ acknowledged the whole Old, Tel Old Testament. Um, and you can, you can bring the whole Bible into that. Other people, other apologists have, have done that. I won't duplicate their efforts. But all five tenets are justified and grounded in the conviction that God's word alone has to be the foundation of any work to remove sin from an individual life, from society, from all of creation, whatever the case may be. Right, so next tenet uh, abolition is gospel centered. The idea is the sla or, slavery is sin, abortion is sin. These these injustices are sin. Uh, they're not just something that's bad, not just uh, something that we don't like and that we want to get rid of. It's not an opinion. It's sin. It's against the law of God. It's against the word of God. So abortion is sin. The only answer to sin is the gospel that you will ever find in scripture. Um, so you've got examples in scripture where people try to solve sin through their own work, uh, through their own righteousness. And then you've got those who trust in the righteousness of Christ to uh, abolish the sin from their, <clears throat> their own personal lives and from their nations. So man cannot save himself from sin. That's central to the message of scripture. And you need to have the gospel. I'll pull up uh, so Timothy. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, this is Paul speaking, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to holy calling, not because of our works, but because of uh, his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. 
and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So where do you get life <laughs> from, if not the gospel, right? So pro-life movement, yes, we're talking about physical life here, but the, the gospel does not just uh, provide spiritual life. It also provides resurrection, as people who know, uh, know their Bible will know. And, and God is dealing with the whole problem of death that's coming to the world. So if you're trying to deal with a situation where people are killing each other for one reason or another, uh, you're not going to be successful in that endeavor if it's a systemic injustice in particular, if you leave the gospel out of it, um, if you leave the law of God and the gospel out of it. So leads to the question, what is the gospel in, in our day? It's very popular to talk about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, which is absolutely one area that the gospel impacts. Uh, what's often ignored, and this is why we say that the evangelical gospel today is often a truncated gospel, uh, is that it's not just about personal sin. That came from the pietist movement a couple hundred years ago. Uh, it's it's not just about personal sin, it's about every effect of the fall, including what sin has done to a nation, what it does to a community, what it does to a family. And so we're dealing with uh, national sin that we need to be producing gospel-centered legislation, right? That's something, I say that, and, and like people watching this will probably be like, what the heck does that mean, gospel-centered legislation? Because the church today hasn't trained our people, hasn't trained us to think about the gospel in all these different areas. So third tenet, uh, the, uh, the work against abortion, abolition must be body driven. So what do we mean by the body? We're talking about the body of Christ. That's what the, what scripture uses to refer to Christians, to the church, that we all are all united together, um, in the body of Christ, which is actually doing things in the earth, right? So as a united body, we should be abolishing slavery. We should be protecting Jews from being slaughtered. In Nazi death camps, we should be abolishing abortion. So only Christians can abolish evils from the world, right? Only Christians have the gospel. So only Christians can abolish evils from the world. We'll take a look at Ephesians. For you may be sure of this, and everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetousness, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. So don't partner with atheists, even if you agree that abortion is wrong, right? Do not partner with the sons of disobedience. Uh, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. All right, so that's New Testament justification for um, agitation, right? Uh, it's, we'll, we'll talk about that later, but it's the idea of exposing evils through your light, through Christian light. So, don't partner with unbelievers who do not have light, unbelievers who are still in darkness, who are still enemies of Christ, who are still in their sin. Don't partner with them, even if you agree on abortion, if you're trying to end an evil, end a sin. So you should rather expose all, all uh, deeds of darkness. Right? So only Christians can, uh, can abolish evils from the world, and all Christians, this is the second half of, of this tenet, all Christians have a duty to abolish evils from the world. So only Christians could do it, and every single Christian has a duty to take part in that. So today, a lot of people think about like, I'm not called to uh, fight abortion or rape or whatever the case may be, because I am singing on the worship team. That's my special gift, or that's my special calling. So that's a misunderstanding of giftings and callings, I believe, and I've done a whole video on it. Uh, which we talked about earlier. So go ahead and check that out if you do not agree. But and we'll just pull up very briefly um, Proverbs 24. This is not in it by any means the whole bulletproof argument, but uh, it's a nice, succinct way of stating it. Rescue those who are being taken away to death. 
hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, behold, we did not know this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who keeps watch over your soul know it? And will he not repay man according to his work? So he's saying you have a duty to rescue people who are dying. Who, uh, if, you, if you're able, right? It's like the parable of the Good Samaritan, the guy dying on the side of the road, and all these religious people are walking past because uh, they've got more important religious things to do, go work in the temple. <clears throat> and it's the religious outcast, the Samaritan, who is his enemy, actually the enemy of the guy on the road, who ends up having compassion on him. And Jesus says you should go and do like the Samaritan. So rescue those who are being taken away to death. And if you want to face God in eternity and say, hey, I didn't really realize uh, what was going on. Well, that may be true or may not. He's the one who knows hearts and he will repay man according to his work. So if you know that abortion is going on in your culture, which now you do, it is about 60 million children since Roe versus Wade, a million kids murdered every year in the United States minimum. And that's just talking about normal abortions. Um, it is a genocide going on and you know about it and you're going to be accountable to Christ for it. So, so fourth tenet is that, so that, that third tenet is what's going to be controversial within the church. The fourth tenet is controversial within the political movement uh, or within politics and within uh, the pro-life movement. So abolition is immediate and uncompromising. And this is one of the real distinctive doctrines of the abolitionists of slavery. There's whole tomes written about it, whole battles fought back and forth about how should slavery be abolished. And there were groups that would say, we need to take these incremental measures, these uh, gradual measures. We allow slavery to continue for a while. Um, in our legislation, we'll, we'll regulate it. We will not abolish it because we think that regulation is easier to get past. Right? And so it's a very pragmatic view. It's very understand and understandable why people would believe it. In fact, after I started getting involved in the abolitionist movement, I, I took exception to this, to this tenet for about three weeks until I really thought through it and heard some good arguments. Um, so I actually have, uh, an argument that I've put together. It's not in video form. You can get it, uh, in the video description. It's a link to an article I wrote. Um, abolition is immediate and uncompromising, and it walks through kind of the theological biblical understanding of how we get here. And a lot of people have found that article helpful. So. You can check that out, Lord willing, one day we'll make a video version of that article to post right here. Um, but I'll just give you a brief example of what we're talking about. So immediatism, so people who want to do these gradual regulation measures, right? Um, they, they're they opposed by immediatists who say, no, it's all or nothing. We are going to accept nothing short of abolishing this great evil. And so a way to understand this would be like a heartbeat bill. So. A heartbeat bill is a bill that's uh, fairly popular right now, where you're saying because a child has a heartbeat and is more viable after that point, we're going to move the age um, of, uh, of when you can kill your child from like 24 weeks or 22 weeks or whatever the state's regulations currently are down to the moment when they have a heartbeat. And so it's supposed to reduce the number of abortions because people are only able to get abortions in a smaller window of time. And it's hailed as like major pro-life uh, uh, legislation. So abolitionists would oppose this, right? We would say, no, it does not completely abolish abortion. Therefore, we would, we would rather keep the injustice in place. That's actually a very bad way of saying it, but that's what our opponents would say about us. So... The problem is uh, it's an unbiblical use of civil law. Um, and it's hard to explain in a short video, so I won't go too in depth, but it, you can think about it in like um, personal terms, right? So if, you're, uh, if you have a friend who is committing adultery, right? Do you have your friend, do you tell your friend when you're telling him what he should do, right? That's what law is. It's telling people what they should do they're morally obligated to do or else see punishment. When you're telling your friend what he should do, are you going to tell him to see his mistress like only two times out of the week instead of three? Are you going to tell him to see her only one time every uh, every two weeks after that? And then slowly over time, maybe work it back to once a month and then maybe long walks on the beach uh, and then just uh, bring it down to an emotional affair. 
or do you tell your friend you need to cut off this adultery completely? Um, and so, you know, obviously on the personal level, what we do is we say, no, you need to cut it off entirely. There should, there should be no compromise with sin because when you compromise with sin, that's what keeps it going, right? We all know this. Anybody who's struggled with addictions or with, uh, with anything like that is that compromise with sin is what keeps it around a compromise standard. So, uh, an example is the legislative realm, um, would be affirmative action. So this, this could be maybe controversial. Hopefully the people who are watching this, it's not affirmative action is a racist legislation, right? It's meant to help minorities, uh, you know, especially black people who, uh, who historically have been underprivileged due to slavery. And the way that it helps them is by putting racism into the law, saying that these particular ethnicities have more privileges than others. So if you're white, then you don't have as many privileges as a minority um, often. Not, not all affirmative action does that, but a lot of it does. And so it's trying to solve racism with more racism, right? And so we would say that that's an unjust law and you need to remove all racism from your law. Well, it's the same thing with abortion, that a heartbeat bill is uh, a bill that has ageism in it, right? It discriminates saying some children prior to having a heartbeat um, are allowed to be murdered and some children after having a heartbeat are not. Um, so because it embeds ageism in, it's not a solution to the already existing ageism. Uh, and then the biblical example, the classic example is Moses and Pharaoh, where God tells Moses to go to Pharaoh and he has these terms and saying, you need to let my people go into the wilderness to worship God for uh, however long. And Pharaoh said, well, you know, your men can go, but the women need to stay behind or something like that. And then eventually Moses, or Moses was like, no, we're all going. And then Pharaoh tried to compromise again, saying, well, you can leave your cattle. Uh, and then Moses said, no, he, he was acting as an immediatist saying, this is what God has said. We're not going to compromise on what he has said. So that's the, that's one of the classic examples of immediacy in the scripture. Whole lot more I could say on that. Like I said, I'll produce a video on that one day, Lord willing, and maybe link it up top. So fifth tenet is that abolition is providential. Right? So living as if God is a real agent in history and that his providence, his care, <clears throat> is actually doing things in, uh, in history. It's not just up to us to abolish abortion. We are full of his spirit. We are his people who are his body, right? the body of Christ, who are working uh, along with him, but he is ultimately the one who is bringing this to pass. So, so I'll just read uh, Psalm 20, 7 through 8. Uh, some trust in chariots and seven horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall, we rise and stand upright. So it's a classic verse from the Old Testament, just talking about how important it is to trust God. And so if he tells you to do something that seems a little crazy, well, then you should do the crazy thing. If he tells you to walk around Jericho seven times, right? You do that crazy thing and you're going to get your victory. Uh, and so classically, uh, pro-life strategies are constantly pragmatic. So it's providential versus pragmatic, trust in God versus trust in man. So pro-lifers, like we just talked about, they'll compromise their legislation, believing it's the only way to get things done because they're trusting in man. They're not trusting in God. So they'll leave the gospel out of the abortion debate to convince and join with atheists, right? So abolitionists will say, no, the gospel is foundational. You can't leave that, even if it doesn't seem practical. Uh, they won't call the church to repent of stuff so that they don't lose funding. They're trusting in man. So it's, uh, it's one of the most important tenets, I think. Uh, I'm going to bring up a sixth tenet. Uh, there's actually been a discussion recently. Is there a sixth tenet of, uh, of abolition? Uh, some people proposed that you have to have a beard uh, just because there's so many bearded people in abolition for whatever reason. Uh, also staying up ridiculously late hours and working on stuff. Also a common trend in abolition. Um, I'm going to say more seriously uh, that if there were a sixth tenet, it would be the doctrine of the lesser magistrate. This is this is a doctrine that uh, was formalized during the Protestant Reformation about how um, lower ruling authorities are to interact with higher authorities who give unjust rulings, and also vice versa, how um, higher authorities should deal with lower authorities that 
do unjust things. So defines a proper biblical resistance to tyranny without going into um, bloody revolutions and whatnot, if at all possible. Um, and it's it's become so well accepted in the abolitionist movement that it's really foundational to our strategy. So it's our answer to the tyranny of the Supreme Court, to uh, tyranny of presidential electors, or electors uh, federal state officials. Tyranny in any place can be addressed by this doctrine because it is not just for the United States, it's for uh, any form of government. All right, so five tenets, maybe a sixth. Uh, now we're going to look at the two modes. What do abolitionists do? So there's two basic things we do. We do assistance and agitation, right? I'll look at agitation first. What it boils down to is speaking the truth, right? So you speak the truth to an individual. Um, that will either lead to the hardening of that person's heart uh, or it will lead to the softening of that person's heart toward personal conversion and trusting in Christ. So you speak the truth to a nation, it's going to lead to either the hardening of that nation or um, submission to the rule of Christ and criminalization of, of evils like abortion. So you can see examples of this in the prophets and the apostles as they would speak to civil rulers and individuals alike. Uh, so then assistance is practical, practical compassion effect, effectively. So it holds people together uh, and it vindicates abolitionists when we're accused of stuff. So it's basically love, right? Uh, it's, it's showing, and that's not to say that speaking the truth isn't loving, but it's showing kindness uh, to people in practical ways. So classic example of that in scripture would be the parable of the Good Samaritan we already talked about. The guy who rescued the Samaritan wasn't just speaking the truth to him about the gospel. He wasn't just sharing the gospel with this guy. He was actually um, you know, bandage, bandaging up his wounds. He was um, putting him on his donkey, paying money to take care of him. Um, he wasn't just speaking out and opposing the thieves that had killed the guy, right? He wasn't dealing with the oppressor. He was actually you know, bandaging the situation. So... Both of these elements, assistance and agitation, are crucial, and, and they should come together um, in every abolitionist. So some examples of assistance. Uh, you give food to a homeless person, right? Provide shelter for a woman in crisis pregnancy. Volunteer at a crisis pregnancy center. Uh, these are all examples of, of ways that you can be showing compassion to people uh, in need both the sinner and, uh, and the child who's being targeted. Uh, and then examples of agitation, you can distribute literature. Um, drop carding is something where you leave literature for people to find. Uh, street preaching, anti-abortion memes online, videos like this one. Uh, and then there's two kinds of errors that people can fall into with these two modes, right? Because the way... The way we seem to operate, this is just, this isn't something I get from scripture. It's just something that abolitionists have noticed is that people will tend to fall into one of these two camps, right? They're going to tend to be the assisters uh, and they'll leave the agitation to other people or think that that's a bad thing. Um, they'll think that, that people street preaching are crazy uh, or they will focus just on agitating the culture and they won't spend any time showing practical compassion to people. So to be like Christ, both are needed. <clears throat> so I'll pull up John. John Wood. He's talking about Christ's incarnation here, what he came and did. The word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Right? So there are two elements there. John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes before me ranks after me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So it's just these two elements of showing kindness, showing mercy, um, showing uh, grace. Uh, and then also not compromising your truth. Right? So the assistance folks, the people who, who err in that direction, will tend to have grace without truth. And you'll see this in many crisis pregnancies, for example, that 
try to help women in crisis pregnancy, but they don't share the gospel with them. They don't talk about sin. They don't talk about repentance. They just uh, work on helping women to try to get them to make a good decision and not abort their child. But they're leaving the power of the gospel out. That's that power. That power is what transforms lives. What leads to good decisions, both now and for the rest of that woman's life. Uh, and then on the agitation side, you'll see truth without grace, <laughs> and it's just this is a problem often in the abolitionist movement. I think we have more proportionally people who are agitators than we have assisters. Uh, that perception may or may not be right. The agitators tend to be vo more vocal, but we've seen even what some people have called the civil war within the abolitionist movement by people having um, an emphasis on biblical debate and discussion and whatnot um, at the absence of grace for one another, at the absence of thinking the best, best of one another. Um, so it's really important just to have that, uh, if you're somebody who's particularly focused on agitation, to always remember the needs of the other person are what's primary. It's not just about speaking uh, truth. It's about speaking the truth that this person needs to hear and doing so uh, seasoned with salt, seasoned with grace. So those are the two modes. Now we're going to take a look, lastly, at the seven stages of abolition. And this is, this is not something that is particularly well-grounded in Scripture, as far as I've heard. There's actually a whole lot of resources on the seven stages. They're not as talked about. Um, this is more grounded in history, as I understand it, what we've seen in prior abolitionist movements. And then it's mostly, it's not really a prediction of what will happen, but it's more... Um, thinking through the state of our world, what needs to happen in order to actually abolish abortion. Okay. So the first stage is called seeding or the seed stage. And that began in Oklahoma about 10 years ago uh, with a single abolitionist society studying the history, studying scripture, and then putting together the five tenets of abolitionism and spreading that ideology out across the internet. And what happened is People looked at that and were like, hey, I agree with that. Uh, we form an abolitionist society over here. And so seeding that ideology, uh, I'm actually going to talk a little bit about that. That's something I'm a little passionate about. That's why I make these videos. Um, it's incredibly important to spread the word of God, right? And not just Bible verses, but to spread uh Word of, the Word of God in a way that uh, applies to the specific situations in our world. And so you're never going to have a movement uh, like we talked about against abortion that's going to succeed unless the Word of God is foundational to it. Um, and seeding is just something that's important through all these stages. Um, and yeah, you know, what? I, I'll make a whole video maybe on that later. We'll see. Um, but it's important to be seeding the correct ideas is basically the idea. Uh, which leads us into the second stage, weeding, which is pulling out all the weeds uh, of the things that grow up alongside abolition. So, for example, um, I think it's Students for Life on their website. I was just looking at it a few weeks ago. Uh, their website talks about abolishing abortion, which is language that came from the abolitionist movement. It wasn't around before our movement started. But talk about abolishing abortion in our lifetime, but then they abandon all the ideology. They abandon the word of God. Uh, you can look at my video on uh, on Students for Life for that um, biblical critique of pro-life diversity. They abandon all the foundation, but then they have this outward language that just looks like it. That's that's what Christ talks about in the uh, parable of the, the wheat and the tares, is that there are these different seeds that are growing up in the same field. They're growing up together. Uh, and it's difficult to recognize them for which one's good, which one's bad. And so Christ said, you wait until the end of the age. It's talking about ultimately um, uh, the end of the age is when you're going to be able to recognize who was, who had the true seed of God's word and who did not. Um, but even in, in these lesser movements, right, is that you're going to need to, as these ideologies bear fruit, as we see the fruit that large pro-life organizations have borne, um, you can tell, hey, these are these are built on built on the foundation of sand. They're built on uh, weedy kind of thinking. So you can distinguish between the wheat uh, and the tares. And then when you're able to do that, to uproot uh, that, to effectively refute false ideologies, is what the weeding is about. 
So you've had plenty of that going on, uh, and it will continue to go on throughout the entire seven stages. Third stage is growth. Uh, abolition becomes a true grassroots movement. We've seen that. Um, you have abolitionist societies, abolitionist organizations growing up, um, division beginning to happen within the pro-life movement as people respond to the word of God. And, uh, and then the fourth stage is re uh, repentance. I, I would say we're actually right now in the growth stage. I don't know how long we'll be there, uh, but we have abolitionist organizations um, that uh, that have accepted these ideas and that have contributed as well. <clears throat> Talk about Pastor Matt Chuella, who are from Missionaries of the Preborn, contributing the doctrine of the lesser magistrate. Uh, I believe he's also got a book coming out on pietism, hopefully next year, uh, that I look forward to reading. So contributions from other organizations that have studied other sides of this are, are happening. But we're in that stage of growth. Uh, the next stage is repentance, right? We see broad cultural and church repentance and recognition of the division between pro-life, uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, all these all these unbiblical and godly ideologies on how to deal with injustice versus the Christian ideas, uh, the abolitionist ideas, I believe. So seeing that, uh, having that clear distinction in the culture where people have to make a choice. Because right now, right now, we're still in the stage where you really can't see uh, the difference between the wheat and the tares. A lot of Christians, a lot of genuine, heartfelt Christians are pouring their money, their time, and the effort. I don't want to say a lot of them are pouring time and effort, but those who do are pouring their effort into these pro-life organizations that are built on a foundation of sand um, because the culture doesn't know that there's a difference between pro-life and abolitionist. So what so the next stage is, is that we see large uh, repentance. We're starting to see some of that in some states um, where entire denominations are coming to understand the difference between abolition and pro-life, which is great. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll add a link to a video on that that I was just watching uh, in the description. You can check it out if you like. Um, but we need to see that across the United States, and we need that to become something that's embedded in the culture where people understand there's a third movement. Uh, and after that, we see, after there's repentance, both in the culture and in the church, we see revival. Nominal Christianity is significantly replaced by a love of God and love of neighbor. And we see strength in numbers for the first time. So right now, as an abolitionist, you're not going to find a lot of other people around you who are going to take part. Uh, and even, even in the abolitionist, abolition of slavery, that uh, was only about 3% of the North that were, historians look back on and say they were abolitionists. But significant revival happens nonetheless, and, and we see... Christians rise up and and do these things. Then the sixth uh, stage is revolution, right? So ideally a nonviolent political revolution uh, where you know, you've got pro-life and pro-choice rulers, officials being replaced with abolitionists. And we're seeing some of that today. We're seeing uh, pro-life legislators getting elected in. We had a number of them this past election season. Uh, pro-life, or not pro-life, abolitionist bills uh, of total, complete, and immediate abolition going forward and forcing the pro-lifers, exposing the pro-lifers, um, pro-life politicians for what they are. Uh, we're starting to see that, but uh, in the revolution phase, you see that happening significantly across the nation. Um, and then the seventh stage, abolition. So the abolitionists win, we enter a reconstruction period, um, and then we have to deal with the next evil that Satan wants to sow into our world. So people uh, at this point look back and claim that they too would have fought abortion. So the seven stages are painted with a broad brush. Uh, reality may have some variation. Like I said, there, it's not a prediction. It's more of an understanding of given the situation we're in, what, what needs to happen. Um, so you'll have elements of all stages present in every stage. Now I'd like to talk to you uh, as you've listened to and engaged with some of this content. I want to I want to ask you how you want to apply this to your life, right? So what does all of this theory and all of this stuff mean to you? Uh, so we're living in a world, right, where there's 60 million plus children dead. Not not in the world. That's just the United States. The world at large, I think, is like 1.3 billion kids dead since like the 80s, I believe. It's kind of insane where it's it's the biggest genocide in all of human history uh, five times 
in terms of America's numbers, being 60 million children dead. Uh, it's five times more than Nazi Germany, more than five times. Uh, and my question to you is, would you have been one of the people who stood in Nazi Germany to help the Jews? We all like to think that we would have been. But would you actually have been somebody who would help the Jews? Would you actually have been somebody who stood up and opposed slavery? Or would you have gone along with the culture? Would you have done the easy thing? Would you have found reasons to uh, nitpick and criticize the abolitionists, even in areas where you're not thinking clearly? Um, these are hard questions. These are questions I had to ask myself when I was first exposed to these ideas. And I want to commend you. I mean, you've, you've done well in listening this far to the, uh, the video that I put together. But I want to ask you to invest some more time into learning because I understand we've talked about a lot and we haven't talked about it in any degree of depth. So investing time uh, is the only way that you're going to be able to really evaluate whether the things we're saying are biblical uh, and whether or not you yourself actually do have a duty to do something about all these children. So when I first encountered these ideas, I almost let it pass. Uh, I thank God. <laughs> I I was intellectually intrigued. That's why I, I got involved. It's kind of like how Angela Lee Grimke, the video was talking about, she didn't really fight slavery originally because she cared about the slaves. She did it because she was concerned about the, um, the slave holders, her brother in, the, in that video. Um, it's kind of similar to me. I didn't actually get involved because I cared about the children. Uh, I got involved because I was intellectually intrigued by the movement. It kind of fits some other stuff I was studying. Uh, but I thank God that he eventually did get a hold of my heart and um, and I spent enough time uh, learning to realize that I actually had a duty and that uh, there was a specific way that God wanted us to go about this. So change the direction of my life, that's for sure. Uh, and if it's biblical, if you find upon evaluating our ideas fairly that it's biblical, I want to encourage you to take action on those beliefs, right? to actually jump into the trenches and start doing something to help these children. And if you do it well, and if you do it biblically, it will be one of the hardest things that you've ever done. And it will be one of the best things that you've ever done. So I would just to lay it out here for you and warn you, Satan will use any tactic he can to deter you, to distract you from learning more, to distract you from actually doing anything. Um, he will use laziness. He will use loneliness, other Christians, your friends not getting involved as well. Uh, he will use conflict with fellow Christians and even fellow abolitionists to try to stop you from doing what the word of God says you need to do. Uh, so my encouragement to you is just to remember eternity. So you're going to give an account to God for your own life, not the actions of others. And uh, you need to understand that this is a cross that God has given the Christians of our day to bear. So I'm going to, I'm going to pull up a, uh, Something from William Lloyd Garrison. He's talking about, uh, so this was something that he wrote. Garrison was another abolitionist from uh, the days of slavery. And he's giving an address uh, later on in the history about um, Garrisonian abolition. Um, so he, he was the guy that ended up getting his name attached to, to things like these five tenets. Um, uh, opposing the colonization society and the like. So that's that's what we are. We are Garrisonian abolitionists would be the kind of thing that we are. Um, that's what historians look at and say they were the real abolitionists. And he says this, of necessity, as well as of choice, I am a Garrisonian abolitionist. Of necessity, because that's his name, but also of choice. Uh, the most unpopular right, appellation that any man can have applied to him. So it's not something glorious to be an abolitionist, to be a Garrisonian abolitionist in particular. The most unpopular appellation that any man can have applied to him in the present state of public sentiment, yet I am more than confident destined ultimately to be honorably regarded by the wise and good. For though I have never assumed to be a leader, I've never sought conspicuity of position, conspicuity of position or notoriety of name, have desired to follow, he would have rather followed other people, uh, if others better qualified would go before and to be lost sight of in the throng of liberty's adherence as a drop is merged into the ocean. Yet, as the appellation alluded to is applied, not with any reference to myself individ <laughs> invidiously, sorry, 
but to excite prejudice against the noblest movement of the age in order that the most frightful system of oppression ever devised by human ingenuity and wickedness may be left to grow and expand to the latest generation. I accept it as the synonym of absolute trust in God and utter disregard of that fear of man which bringeth us there. So he was a providentialist. He was not a pragmatist. And so deem it alike honorable and praiseworthy. So he's saying people have taken my name and they have uh, made it this appellation, this name for horrible people that you should not want to be around. But he says that, yes, he is willing to take that uh, shame upon himself because it is honorable and praiseworthy and will be recognized as such by those who came after him. So now everybody looks at the abolitionists and they're like, these guys are heroes. In their day, they were vastly unpopular. Representing then that phase of abolitionism, which is the most contemned, to the suppression of which the means and forces of the church and the state are most actively directed. I am here to defend it against all its assailants as the highest expediency, the soundest philosophy, the noblest patriotism, the broadest philanthropy, and the best religion extant. To denounce it as fanatical, disorganizing, reckless of consequences, bitter and irreverent in spirit, infidel in heart, deaf alike to the suggestions of reason and warnings of history, is to call good evil and evil good, to put darkness for light and light for darkness, to insist that Barabbas is better than Jesus, to cover with infamy the memories of the patriarchs and prophets, apostles and martyrs, and to inaugurate Satan as the god of the universe. This guy can write. If like the sun, it is not wholly spotless. So he's saying, yeah, abolitionists are not flawless, but it is not wholly spotless. Still, like the sun, without it, there is no light. It is absolutely necessary. If murky clouds obscure its brightness, still it shines in its strength. If that it seems to wane to its final setting, if it looks like it's going down, it is only to reveal itself the splendor of a new ascension, unquenchable, glorious, sublime. So that is what the abolitionists today are doing. This is the ascension of new light after the abolitionist movement of slavery uh, waned, right? And there's a new evil of our day that needs the light of Christ to go against it. And so I'm going to share with you what that evil looks like. Because you need to know that there are people who are depending on you, who are depending on me, to fight this. Their lives are on the line every single day. Kids are being killed by this. And it is a real injustice. Like I said, it's the greatest Holocaust in human history, just in terms of its scope. We need you to take these things seriously and spend some serious time thinking through whether or not you have a duty to help this child, to help the millions of children that are dying while we watch our movies and play our video games without giving them another thought. As Garrison uh, alluded to, people will say all kinds of things about you, just preparing you for this. <laughs> it takes a little bit of backbone. It takes a relationship, a living relationship with Jesus Christ, who also uh, was slandered about and whatnot. Uh, but like I said, it will be some of the most fulfilling work that you will ever do. And if you listen to one video after this, uh, I would encourage you to listen to the video I mentioned earlier abortion ministry, special calling, or everyone's duty. I want to persuade you. This one, I, I believe this video has been fairly persuasive. I want to persuade you that you have a duty to help this child. The reason that I, I prioritize that video, it's relating to the third tenet, but I think it's kind of the most important for Christians at least. Um, once you understand it's your duty, you'll be motivated to learn everything that you need to know. There's a lot to know. There's a lot of theological change that I went through. Um, and there's, I'm still constantly learning things as I'm coming to understand how scripture applies to this injustice to civil government and to culture at large. So lots of learning to do, but this idea will motivate you to actually do that learning and then to step out and actually take action. Right? Uh, more you more than you can do you can like this video uh, if you want to encourage it or, or help the video to go out to more people give it a like uh, subscribe uh, watch through the playlist that i have on abolitionism uh, and then that will help to prepare you for the days to come next week i am starting a series on how to run for political office 
Uh, this is for Christians who want to run for office but don't know where to start. I wasn't going to make the video, but a friend actually reached out to me and asked me to, and so it's kind of a confirmation. So it's not a series on how to win. Uh, I didn't win my election. I lost it. Uh, I wasn't running to win. There's other good reasons to run for office. So, But I can give at least some insight into what tactically people have to do in order to actually go from point A to point B. So it's a practical series on how to get started, and I hope you have a good week, and I will see you then.